Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. Thank you so much for choosing to spend a little time with us viewing our Thursday night Bible study. And I pray that something uh, that you receive will be helpful to you on your future journey. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your word to, that teaches us either about joy or sorrow. Help us to live in a way that will uh, not only bring us joy, but will cause you to be glad in your heart because of the choices that we make. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our subject for tonight is his hope for joy turned to sorrow. His hope for joy turned to sorrow. This story is about a young man that came to Jesus seeking hope of eternal life and the joy that it would bring. But he went away sorrowful because of his encounter with Jesus. Our text for tonight is found in the book of Luke's chapter 18, verse uh, 18 through 30. That's Luke chapter 18, verse 18 through 30, and I'm reading the English Standard Version. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, and honor your father and mother. And he said, all of these things have I kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said, to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and come and follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad or sorrowful for he, had, he was extremely rich. And Jesus seeing that he had uh, come, had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left his house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Now, this uh, rich young ruler uh, can be seen as a misled youth. The rich young ruler may be the only person in the four gospels who came to the feet of Jesus and went away worse than when he came. And yet he had so much in his favor. He was moral and religious, earnest and sincere, and probably would have qualified for membership in any of the average churches today. But yet he refused to follow Jesus Christ and instead went his own way in great sorrow. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 says, there is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. What was wrong with this young man? In other words, he was dishonest. In spite of the fact that he came to the right person, asked the right question, and received the right answer, he made the wrong decision. Why? Because he was not honest with God or himself. And therefore, he would not do what he was commanded to do. He was a superficial young man who said one thing but did another. Now consider the three areas that he was misled in. 
The first one is found in verse 18 and 19 is his view of Jesus Christ. His view of Jesus Christ. Verse 18 says, And the ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. The rabbis were called master or teachers, but it was very unusual for a rabbi to be called good. And this young man saw Jesus as a teacher or from God, and he called him good. The Jews reserved the word good for God only. Psalms 34 verse 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And blessed is the man who takes his refuge in him. Psalms 106 and verse 1 says, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Now, this explains why Jesus asked the young man what he meant. Because if he really believed that Jesus was good, it also meant that he was confessing that Jesus was God. By asking this question, Jesus was not, not denying his de deity, but acknowledging it. He was testing the young man to see if he really understood what he had just said. And he's, his subsequent behavior proved that this young ruler did not believe that Jesus was God. If he really thought that uh, that he was in the presence of the almighty God? Why did he argue, even though politely, about the law? Why did he brag about his character and then refuse to obey the word? Surely he knew that God sees the heart and knows all things. So he had the wrong view of Jesus Christ. The second area that he was misled in his view of sin. Uh, verse 20 and 21 says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And verse 21 says, and he said, all these have I kept from my youth. He also had a superficial view of his own sin. No doubt, this young man sincerely tried to keep the law. In fact, this may have been what brought him to the feet of Jesus in the first place. Jesus did not quote the law to him as a means of salvation because obedience to the law does not save anyone. He held the law before the young man as a mirror to veal reveal his sins to him, as stated in uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, and Galatians uh, chapter 2, verse 21, and also chapter 3, verse 21 of the book of Galatians. But the young man looked into the mirror and would not see the stains and blemishes in his own life. He was a hearer, but not a doer of the word. And when Jesus quoted from the second table of the stone, of the tablet, rather, the law, he did not quote the last commandment because the first nine deals with uh, uh, our actions. That's it. The first nine deals with our action, but the last commandment deals with our motives. Jesus said, thou shalt not commit, uh, thou shalt not covet. Excuse me, I had to cut the phone off. Now, Jesus knew the young man's heart, and so instead of preaching to him about covetousness, he asked him to do something that a covetous person would not do. Nobody is saved by giving all of his wealth to the poor. But nobody can be saved who will not repent of his sins and truly turn away from them. 
This young man was possessed by the, his love of money and he would not let his money go. Without faith, it's impossible to please God and without uh, the faith uh, that has actions, it's dead. So we must have faith in God and our faith must show in our actions. This young man could not show his faith in actions. Now, the third way that he was misled is found in the fact that his view of salvation was a misleading view. Uh, verse 22 and uh, 23 says, uh, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and then come and follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. So he had a misled uh, view of salvation. Now, the young man thought that eternal life came to those who did something, which was typical of the Jewish conviction. But when G Jesus gave him something to do, he refused to obey. Doesn't that sound a lot like the predicaments that we find ourselves in in this day and time? We, we, we treat salvation as if it's based upon something that we do. When it comes down to doing what God asks us to do, we got a problem with it. He asks us to walk by faith and not by sight. We are saved not by anything that we do, but we are saved only by our faith in what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary. This young man wanted salvation on his own terms and not God's terms. So he turned away and went away in great sorrow. The disciples were shocked when Jesus announced that uh, it was difficult for a rich person to be saved. They, they, they were Jews and the Jews believed that riches were a mark of God's blessings. And if rich people can't be saved, they reason, uh, what hope is there for the rest of us? It's kind of like John D. Rockefeller uh, once said, uh, and he probably would have agreed with them. Uh, well, he once said that riches were a gift from heaven signifying this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So often we are misled into thinking that because of what we have, because of what we can do or do, it's an indication of God's pleasure in our lives. It's not our possession of riches that keeps people out of heaven. If that was the case, Abraham, David, Solomon, they were all rich men. It's being possessed by riches and trusting them to make salvation, that it's trusting them that makes salvation difficult for the wealthy. Wealth gives people a false sense of success and security. And when people are satisfied with themselves, they feel no need for God. Peter's comment in Luke chapter 18, verse 28, suggests that he had a rather commercial view of discipleship. What then will there be for us, he asked. And Jesus promised all of them a blessing in this life, plural blessings in this life and reward in the life to come. But then he balances his word with another announcement about his impending suffering and death. And if we're gonna follow Jesus, we've got to be willing to take up our cross 
and follow him daily. Jesus uh, uh, wanted to point it out and, and cause Peter to ask himself a question. How could Peter be thinking about personal gain when his Lord and master was going to Jerusalem to be crucified? The rich young ruler is a warning to people who want a Christian faith that does not change their values or upset their lifestyle. Too many people want a Christian faith that does not change their values or upset their lifestyles. And Jesus is calling us to a radical change, to not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Don't be like the world, but be peculiar, a peculiar treasure to him. Now, Jesus did not command everyone seeking uh, him to sell everything and give to the poor. But he does put his finger on conviction on any area in our lives about which we are dishonest about. As I close for now, allow me to mention another man that made a request of Jesus. He wasn't rich. He wasn't a ruler over anybody. As a matter of fact, he was a person that's, who, who had a vocation of causing a disturbance. And in, in other words, he was an insurrectionist, a troublemaker. And he met Jesus in what could be seen as the last hour of his life. This young man that we've studied about tonight had an opportunity to, to, to come back to Jesus. But this man that I'm talking about now was on the cross, across from Jesus, to be crucified. They were both there on a cross. And this man, for wrong that he had done in life, and Jesus for the wrong that this man had done in his life, and the wrong that we have done in our lives. This man could not do anything except what he did to make, to be right with God. He accepted what Jesus was doing. This man simply asked Jesus to remember him when he entered into his kingdom. And Jesus' response was, this day you shall be with me in paradise. This man did not go away sorrowful, but instead received joy in the reply that he received from Jesus. Everyone who accepts what Jesus did on an old rugged cross gets joy. And everyone that rejects the work of Jesus, rejects Jesus and eternal life to come. Jesus hung, bled, and he died to save sinners. In one respect, they buried him in a borrowed tomb. But in three days, he rose from the dead with all power, in heaven and in earth, in his hands. Power to lift up bowed down heads. Power to set free those that are held captive by sin and Satan. And he's looking at somebody right now with love and compassion, ready to turn your sorrow into joy. Just as he saved uh, this man that was about to die. Jesus asked him, this man asked Jesus to save him. And all you've got to do if you're in your sorrow is to ask Jesus to save you from your sorrows. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, each day we face uh, different situations that can bring joy or sorrow into our lives. We ask that you would help us to endure the things that bring us sorrow and count them all a joy. 
and help us to appreciate and share the joy that you give us. In Jesus' masterful name we pray. Amen. And that's all I've got for tonight. Or to, yeah, tonight. Uh, I pray that you will uh, remember uh, as we are in this pandemic, uh, pandemic uh, season and uh, uh, most of the United States and in other countries, uh, the number of individuals that are contracting this COVID-19 disease is on the rise again. So you must wear your mask. It is a proven fact that wearing a mask does help. And not only wearing your mask, but practicing social distancing and washing your hands often. And I, I you know, uh, uh, these are some things that are going to help me in the future when COVID-19 is no longer with us. I might not wear a mask, but I will think twice about people entering into my space, my personal space. And I will be more conscious of when I'm too close to somebody in their personal space. And I believe I'm going to wash my hands often for the rest of my life. One other thing I need to say before I go, and that is uh, five days to go to vote. We have five more days before November uh, 3rd. They are saying that it's too late to mail in uh, absentee ballots or mail in ballots and be assured that it will get to the right place in time. So if you can still do early voting, I recommend that you get out and do early voting between now and the last day that you can early vote wherever you are. And then if you don't get a chance to early vote on November 3rd, do all that is within you to get to the poll and do all that you have to do to let your vote count, to cast your vote. Each vote counts. And with that, so long.